Well, greetings, everyone. Uh, once again, we uh, meet together via the internet. Uh, be glad when we can all meet together again. Uh, but we're thankful that we have this uh, ability and this opportunity to do this and uh, to uh, uh, speak for our Lord again. And uh, let's remember those who are suffering from this virus, this uh, pandemic. Uh, boy, a lot, of, a lot of families being affected in a terrible way. And let's, let's remember to uh, pray for them. And, Lots of folks going out into eternity. Let's uh, tonight, today, tonight, I want to uh, think about the Passover. We've been uh, studying on uh, views from Mount Calvary, and and this harks back to Exodus, to the uh, the first Passover, and of course. Uh, as with Easter, com with Easter coming up, we think of uh, the Last Supper, and which, uh, for uh, you know, our Lord fulfilled the Passover. Second uh, Corinthians five, verses six and seven says, "For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice for us." So He fulfilled, and and uh, in effect, fulfilled all of the the Passover prophecies and all the types and uh, we want to look at a little bit of that today um, in Exodus chapter 12 and I want to back up just a little bit into chapter 11 because this is at the end of the plagues that the Lord had sent on Pharaoh and Egypt to uh, let my people go that's what Moses was saying you know Pharaoh kept hardening his heart and uh, you know the Lord knew that Pharaoh was going to harden his heart he was he was obdurate to the nth degree and uh, you know the Lord had this had the Passover planned all the time because he was deliverance of his people from the house of bondage um, that is a picture of him delivering us from the bondage of sin and, and our Lord Jesus did that uh, by being the Passover I want to read just a few verses uh, verses 4 through 8 of chapter 11 evidently this is Moses uh, still having a, an audience with Pharaoh a bit, so let me just let me just get into the scripture and then we'll uh, ask the Lord to bless and, and guide us. And Moses said, "Thus saith the Lord: About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth on his throne." even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that you may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel and all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow down themselves unto me saying get thee out and all the people that follow thee and after that I will go out and he that is Moses went out from Pharaoh in a great anger you have to wonder what Pharaoh thought about that uh, First time that Moses had had uh, been able to issue an ultimatum like that, but the Lord had turned him loose to do that. And then in Exodus chapter twelve, I want to quickly read verses one through thirteen. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, "This month shall be unto you the beginning of months." Now, when this Passover was established, 
it reset the calendar as far as the Lord's concerned. And of course, as far as the Lord's concerned, is the way it is. <laughs> and this was to be the first month for Israel from now on. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. If the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and, and, and with the pertinence thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And then the verses, the following verses, are, the Lord is establishing it as a memorial, telling them that they, they are to continue to do this, as well as uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread afterwards. For seven more days they were to eat unleavened bread. All this was a memorial to remember what he had done. Uh, and then verses 21 through 23, he says, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and, and kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For well, the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer, that is, will not allow the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. In verse 28, And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded so did they. And I might say above that, it says, uh, when he had said these things, the people bowed their heads and worshipped. And then it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Father God, it says we look into this first Passover and Lord, what it meant to Israel and Lord, also what it means to us, but because you have redeemed us with your own precious blood. We pray in Jesus' precious name, the one who shed his blood for us. Amen. And to tie this with the with our 
experience in the New Testament. Uh, I'd like to read a couple of verses. Uh, John 1 and 29, you remember when uh, Jesus came to John the Baptist and John saw him walking. John 1, 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And then Peter, 1 Peter 1 and uh, 18 and 19, these are some precious verses. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now for us, as a, um, in our ex experience, our standing before the Lord, notice this. This is in Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 10 through 14. By the will, by which will, that is the Father's will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. No more need the Passover because our Lord Jesus Christ is our Passover sacrifice for us and willingly did so. But I want to look at uh, why the Lord designed this, how he designed this to, to uh, educate, that is to uh, help the Israelites see. You know, they, they were in bondage. They had cried unto the Lord. He had heard them, and, and he sent Moses to uh, lead them out. But he didn't want to just lead them out without a lesson, an eternal lesson for them to, to ponder on all of their generations. And so this Passover was four things that, we know that the Lord intended for it to do for them and for us, that is to stir the will, to startle our minds, to strike our hearts, and to stab our conscience. Now, in this day and time, folks don't seem to want their conscience stabbed. This, uh, I tell you, this is a this is a me time, and I don't know what happened to we, but but this. Uh, Everybody's real, real brave to express their opinions when they're hiding behind a a, a a computer screen. I wish we could get back to communicating more face to face. But the Lord knew that something more effective than miracles and signs and wonders was going to be was needed to bring about redemption from the house of bondage. So the situation called for the shedding of blood, the blood of the Passover lamb. So we see on the 10th day of the first month, every Hebrew father set aside a lamb and uh, they washed it to the 14th day, to make sure there was no blemish. And then on the 14th day it was to be slain, the blood of the lamb was to be applied to the lintel and doorposts. And, uh, the blood was caught in the basin, and and uh, some tell us that the blood that was left in the basin was set on the doorstep. I don't, I don't know, but it, if that's true, it, it, all the four points of the cross are covered, uh, and it was notice it wasn't sprinkled on the threshold because the blood 
of the Lamb is not to be trampled on. As a matter of fact, Hebrews has a stern warning for those who trample underfoot the Son of God. In the night of redemption came at last, the family gathered inside the house that had the blood protected door. The angel of the Lord went throughout the land. And what happened that first Passover night was a magnificent type or picture of the death of Christ as a true Passover lamb. And think about this. Judgment and salvation both went through the land at the same time that night. But preparation had been made for the judgment. Those who were sheltered behind blood were saved. <clears throat> so the will was stirred because every Hebrew father knew what he had to do. We note that sometimes the house was too little for the lamb, but the lamb was never too little for the house. Christ is always adequate. And think about this. In all this, you notice that nothing was left to chance. The Lord didn't even leave it anyone a choice. He said, everything was carefully spelled out. The lamb was selected, and the lamb was secured, and, and then the lamb was slain. Because it was to be without blemish, uh, uh, take it from the sheep or the goats, first year. And, uh, and, and there may have been all kinds of folks, maybe they had an objection or an argument, but because of why, why was all this? Somebody may have said, well, I'm a decent, more religious person, a good husband and father. I think that's sufficient. Well, yeah, well. You know, Cain thought that was sufficient too, didn't he? He, he brought the he brought the best that he could grow, and he expected the Lord to uh, to be satisfied with that. But as you recall from reading in Genesis, the smoke of his offering went up and came right back down, and and Abel ascended up to the smoke of his offering ascended up to the Father. Why was that? Because God was pleased with his because Abel had brought a lamb. Very early, uh, matter of fact, it called, over in Hebrew, it calls Abel, um, righteous Abel. He knew that the innocent had to die for the guilty. It, it, amazing how early he knew that, but the Holy Spirit revealed it to him. Now, Somebody else might say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, be like Cain. I, 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 I've done the best I could. I, I, one of my classmates one time stood up. We, <laughs> we was having kind of a little testimony session in school. Well, you can't do that now. Back when I was in school, you could. And he stood up and said, you know, uh, I've got a certain set of rules that I go by. And I believe if I keep those, I'll be all right. And, uh, our teacher, bless her heart, I'm glad she, 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 she said, "Well, Dunny, that's not what the Bible says." Yeah. She said, "You better, you better, uh, you better do it the way God says do it. You better depend on what He says, not on what you think." And so, then the Lamb, because God said, "When I see the blood, I will pass over you." That's what God has to say about salvation. And then the lamb was secured. That lamb was a type of Christ. Uh, it was watched for four days. You know, in, in the last week that our Lord was here, as a matter of fact, um, Brother James brought a message on Palm Sunday, this past Sunday was Palm Sunday. And these next few days, this is Holy Week, this next few days, we see our Lord going out to Bethany and coming back into Jerusalem earlier morning and, and teaching and, and 
and just really opening himself up to inspection. And, uh, and we know that there was no fault in him. There are all kinds of testimony about, you know, Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Uh, Peter said, in him was no sin. Uh, and even, the, even his enemies, they couldn't find anything to lay at his feet, they had to try to drum up charges. They 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 took false witnesses and and all that, and they still couldn't get any any to agree. And so that we come to the, the point where uh, the Lord intended for this to startle their minds, our minds. You know, the Lord startled a lot of minds that week. He uh, he went in and did the second cleansing of the temple. Um, he, he, uh, he, he really, he, he really got serious with the, uh, scribes and the Pharisees and he, he, he told them what their future held and, uh, tried to, uh, get them to, to turn around, repent. Uh, now here's something that startles our mind that, this is a little, it seems so unreasonable. Why did there have to be all this seemingly senseless killing back in the first? Uh, we know from what the scripture says that there was 600,000 men on foot that left Israel, left Egypt. And so that meant their, their families as well. Think of all the lambs that were uh, slaughtered that night. And, and a skeptic might say, well, I don't, uh, you know, Hey, you Christians, how how can blood cleanse sin? And one one guy asked a Christian that one time. How how, is it, how how do you think blood cleanses sin? And the Christian responded with a question of his own. He said, "Well, how does water quench thirst?" And the skeptic said, "Well, I don't know how water quenches thirst, but I know that it does." And the Christian said, "Well, I too." I do not know how blood cleanses sin, but I know that it does. You know what that speaks of? Experience. The critic could say, by experience, I know that water cleanses thirst because I, 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 I've drunk it, I've tried it, and I've done it. And the Christian simply replied, well, I know that Christ's blood has cleansed me of my sins. I know by experience because I trusted him to save me and keep me saved and I can go on happy through life and, and and looking forward to the life to come which has already begun really because eternal life is a present possession from the moment we trust Jesus Christ God does not require that we understand his plan of salvation he asks us to trust and obey you know, the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And, you know, blindness does exist. Uh, there's natural blindness uh, that came to us as a result of the fall. But then there's also willful blindness, the blindness of those who choose not to believe divine truth even when it is presented to them. They think of dozens of ways to pick holes in the gospel. And then they say that they can't believe. What they mean is that they won't believe. I remember reading D.L. Moody. Uh, one time he had been preaching and, and uh, that, that back in those days they had inquiry rooms where folks that didn't respond by coming down the aisle they could they could inquire afterwards and there was a young man in the inquiry room he was just struggling 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 and he he said mr moody i i just i just can't believe and i love what the uh, Moody said to him he said young man whom can't you believe whom can't you believe? And that's the key to it. You know, we don't trust in a, a plan of salvation. We trust in the man of salvation. Who does the saving? 
not the plan. The plan points us to the man. The man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 100% God, 100% man. He does the Savior. When we trust Him and Him alone as our own personal Savior and trust Him, trust Him to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. You know, we studied last week about Ruth asking Boaz to do that for her. When she said, when she laid down his feet and she said, please do for me what I cannot do for myself. Redeem me. Beautiful picture of salvation. The truth of salvation full and free through the blood of Calvary's Lamb is the greatest truth in the universe. And isn't it sad that it's fast becoming a crime to share that greatest truth? You know, we get we get accused of uh, hate crimes and if we if we share, but we we must not let that deter us. We got to keep on keeping on, because Jesus said, "You shall be witnesses unto me." Now, here's a wonderful truth: God, who cannot look upon sin. And according to Psalm 7, 11, is angry with the wicked every day, yet he is willing to blot out our sins, Isaiah 44, 22, and does so freely by his grace, Romans 3, 24. Moreover, he is willing to adopt us into his own family, Romans 8, 15 through 17, and seat us on high with Christ, Ephesians 2, 1 through 7 all because of the infinite price paid by the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Hmm. It surely is incredible to the angels that humanity, having been confronted with such truth, should respond by yawning in the face of God. And I'd like to say just a word here. I, I've known some high rollers in my time, if there's still some high rollers out there <laughs> that live high, wide, and handsome. Uh, let, me have a, let me just say I have a word with you. You know, love is calling out your name. If you're listening, and if you've heard a, 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 a good old gospel preacher preach the gospel, and, and you know that the Lord loves you, that's why he died for you. He proved it. Man, he proved it. Now, come on. No more behave like a brute beast. Be a man and own up to your great need. Then the Lord can deliver you. This Passover, this first Passover, was designed to strike the heart God's demand was for a lamb. He did not want a full-grown full ram full of fire, fighting fire. He didn't uh, want an old sheep set in its ways. He wanted a lamb, soft and gentle, lovable and trusting. You know, that little lamb Innocent. Think about that father knowing what he had to do in, in just, a, just four days. The whole process was intensely personal and emotional. And it was, in, it was intended to be emotional. That's why when we look at Calvary and, and we ponder Calvary, it should bring tears to our eyes. And it will if we'll if we'll consider that old hymn, when I survey the wondrous cross on which, on, which, on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss. And here's the line I love. And pour contempt on all my pride. That's when a man is fitting 
a fitting vessel to worship the Lord. As much as it hurts that earthly father to do that to that little lamb, up in heaven, God the Father entered into it all. The anguish, the pain, the broken heart. I want to share a little true story with you. I meant to share it the other day when we talked about Mount Moriah and the Father's anguish, but I forgot it. True story. And, and, and all of these stories are not going to, none can adequately paint the picture of what the father went through, what the son went through. <clears throat> but this will help us a little bit. Back in 1937, uh, during the Great Depression, in Missouri, uh, there was a man named John Griffith who operated a the uh, Great Railroad Drawbridge across the Mississippi. Uh, one day in the summer of 1937, he, he decided to take his eight-year-old son, Greg, with him to work. At noon, John put up the bridge to allow ships to go under it, and him and Greg sat down on the uh, observation deck eat lunch. Time passed quickly, kind of got away from him, and suddenly he was, he startled, was startled to hear this, the, the, a train whistle in the distance. And he looked at his watch, it was 107. The Memphis Special, with 400 passengers, was uh, fast approaching. He jumped off the, leaped to his feet, off the observation deck, and ran back to the control tower, and uh, he uh, glanced down at the bridge below to see, make sure there wasn't any ships underneath that would be caught if he, when he lowered it. And, and he, caught, he saw a sight that just chilled his blood. His son, eight-year-old Greg, had fallen off of the uh, observation deck and was caught in the massive gears his left leg was caught in the massive gears that uh, lowered and raised the bridge. John cast about in his mind for a plan that he could, but as soon as he thought of one, he knew there was not time to execute it. And with tears in his eyes, and as the Memphis Special was coming, Around the bend, he knew he had to do what he had to do. And he pushed that giant lever, the bridge lowered just as the, the Memphis Express came roaring up onto the bridge and it went down just as the train came onto the bridge. He buried his face in his left arm while he held that lever in place. And through tear-stained eyes, he looked up at the passengers in that train as it went by. New, uh, businessmen were casually reading their afternoon paper. Finely dressed ladies were sipping their coffee. Children were shoving long-handled spoons into their ice cream. No one looked at the control house. No one noticed the tear-stained face of the father, and no one heard him cry. I just sacrificed my son for you people. Don't you care? Don't you care? And it harks back to Lamentations 1 and 12. Is it nothing to you, you that pass by? Consider the frame of mind of this, this family as they ate the lamb and the bitter herbs. It was designed to strike the heart. It was intended to bring home the cost of their salvation. 
the hushed people keeping this first Passover realized that sin and death were dreadful realities. The radical character of sin called for a radical cure. And now, the last point, stabbing our conscience. Why did that lamb have to die? Because of sin? Because of, why did Jesus? Jesus didn't have to die. Jesus chose to die for us. On account of my sin, on account of yours, it was a, you know, sin has to be punished. Someone might say, well, I'm an agnostic. I don't believe a word of it. You know how much weight that would carry in eternity? No. For every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to glory the Father. Being an agnostic is, a, is about the most foolish thing that a folk could do. <clears throat> Now, when they came out the next morning, think about during the night, they heard the shrieks and the cries of anguish and woe and will of the Egyptians. When they came out of their houses the next morning, you know, Pharaoh and all the Egyptians had already come up and told them, get out of here, y'all get out of here. We're, we're nothing but dead men if y'all are here. And they had to leave in a hurry. That's why the Lord had them eat this with the, uh, their loins girded up, that is, they were, they were ready, ready to travel, had shoes on their feet, had the staff in their hand. They were ready. They were ready to leave at a moment's notice. And, you know, that kind of, one time when I was studying this before, it made me think of the, of the rapture. Uh, you know, we need to be ready for, uh, in such an hour as we think not, son of man cometh. That is, if he can call us away from here, I know he called us away individually all the time, but uh, he could call us away from here right now. And that one that we were we were going to get around to witnessing to, what will happen to them? But when they came out of the house, they looked. The blood was still there. Hallelujah! The blood was still there, and the blood is still there, and it still speaks. It continues to speak. You know, there were some fellas one day that was talking, they was kind of mouthing off of Jesus a little bit, I guess. And he was talking about, don't labor for the meat, for the, uh, the meat which perishes, but for that which endures unto everlasting life. And they said, well, what, 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 what must we do to work the works of God? And in John 5, 24, Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. And that's what the Passover is all about. It might seem complicated to us to think to read back over it all, but the bottom line is Christ died for us. He freely shed his blood for us. For sin had sin demanded the payment. We couldn't pay it. But he paid it for us. Praise his holy name. Father, thank you the gift of your Son. Lord Jesus, thank you for being so willing to come and die for us. Help us to live for you. Lord, again, just please help everyone through this time. And as we all come as a nation and as individuals to realize that we, uh, that we have been just a little bit too lifted up with pride and, and help us to Lord, be humble in heart and to return to our first love. And Lord, help us to be about your business of sharing you with others. In your precious name we pray. Amen.